This video is going to cover the topics of cardiomyopathy and heart transplants. This is on page 479 to page 487 in your Honan textbook, and it is content that we thought was being covered in a previous course, and it was not, so it's been added to Nursing 220 and Nursing 450. So cardiomyopathy is simply a disorder of the myocardium. It can be mechanical or electrical or both in terms of the dysfunction of the heart. It is just not functioning properly. The result is decreased cardiac output due to decreased stroke volume, the inability of the heart to pump effectively, that contractility factor that we talked about earlier. Um, in this uh, particular situation, anytime you have a sympathetic nervous system, a fight or flight response, a renin, angiotensin, aldosterone response, uh, this leads to increased systemic vascular resistance, increased sodium and fluid retention. This causes increased workload on the heart. So if we have cardiomyopathy, then the end result of because of this sympathetic nervous system and RAA response, we can have severe heart failure, we can experience dysrhythmias, and end up with potentially fatal damage to the myocardium. There are several types of cardiomyopathy that your book talks about, um, and I'm just telling you that there's a very slim chance that the NCLEX or the ATI predictor will ask you specific questions about these various types of cardiomyopathy. If you are understanding generally that we are going to have signs and symptoms of really bad heart failure in some of them, arrhythmias, damage to our heart valves, and primarily our diagnostics for all of these types are going to be echocardiograms, cardiac caths, in the case of the um, genetic disorders, family history is going to be very important. EKG, those sorts of um, types of um, diagnostic tests. So the management is going to be medications, ACE inhibitors, aldosterone antagonists, diuretics, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. We've talked about a lot of these. We'll be talking about them again. Uh, pacemakers, intraaortic balloon pumps, which we'll talk about in a bit. And we're going to be assessing for signs of worsening heart failure, dyspnea, crackles in the lungs, peripheral edema, abnormal heart sounds. So remember all of those signs of really, really bad heart failure. Monitor for any dysrhythmias that might develop. Our surgical interventions are septal myectomy or alcohol septal ablation. Sometimes there is a thickened septum, and we need to uh, thin that out um, by surgery or by the alcohol that, because that thickening of the septum is impeding blood flow through uh, the left ventricle. We can have mechanical circulatory support, such as the intraaortic balloon pump, which helps to reduce ventricular afterload, decreasing the workload on the heart. ECMO, which basically exchanges oxygen and CO2 outside, extracorporeal, outside of the body. Um, ventricular assist devices, or LVADs, left ventricular assist devices, which help uh, pre-transplantation or for end-stage heart failure that is not eligible for transplant. Um, and with VADs, patients will not have a palpable pulse or a quote-unquote normal blood pressure. The total artificial heart, which replaces both ventricles and is, again, a bridge to transplant. Our nursing care, our potential complications, we need to watch for infections, dysrhythmias, clots, hemorrhaging, heart failure, and mechanical failure of those circulatory devices. Uh, anticoagulation therapy, uh, prevent and treat infections, and patient education. <clears throat> So the ventricular assist device, a little bit more detail on that, a mechanical circulatory device which partially or completely replaces the function of the failing heart. It can be internally implanted long-term while waiting for transplant, 
or it can be external, short-term, post-surgery, or post-MI. And here is a patient with a ventricular assist device. Here is an external VAD. And here is an internally planted VAD. So let's talk about transplants. The criteria for someone to get a heart transplant is that they do not have any significant comorbidities that could impact their prognosis post-transplant. So some contraindications are a severe pulmonary hypertension, which is not uh, treatable, malignancies, active infections, all of those would be potential contraindications for that transplant. The most common is something called the orthotopic transplant, where part of the recipient's atria plus the pulmonary veins and the vena cava are left in place and the new heart is grafted to that remaining uh, part of the patient's own heart. So here's an orthotopic heart transplant and uh, where you can see the suture lines of what is remaining from the recipient and what is from the donated heart. Post-op care, it's a fine balancing act of balancing the risk of rejection with risk of infection. So we're giving them um, uh, autoimmune, um, we're giving them immunosuppressants uh, to reduce risk of uh, rejection, but of course that puts them at a higher risk for infections. Other complications could be uh, problems with their allograft, um, the graft that uh, they received where the blood vessels or there's atherosclerosis of the arteries, and of course, rejection of the transplanted heart. And a lot of stressors, psychosocial support for these patients is quite significant. Um, fear of rejection, the complexity of their post-transplant med medical regimens, the financial impact that this places on the family, both the financial costs of the surgery and the loss of income and by the patient, as well as maybe family members that are now going to be full-time caregivers. And dealing with end-of-life issues. I think a lot of patients feel that, okay, I'm going to get a heart transplant. This is going to cure everything. I'm going to live forever. And they're still dealing with some end-of-life issues and um, the possibility of an early death.